we're all trying to find out who we are, really. E- even as young boys, when 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, we start finding out who we are and what we like. But we learn really quickly how to please other people and how to get our needs met. And sometimes it means we become really good at something that people want us to be good at. Good afternoon, Steve. Uh, Good morning to you. (laughs) How are you, Brian? Good to see you. I'm doing well. Thanks for uh, coming on the show here. Uh, So I'll do a quick introduction for you and then you can fill in any gaps I miss. You were probably wondering when I asked you to come on the show, you probably looked at the the website for Cashflow Podcast. You're like, man, why the hell is Brian asking me to come on a tech podcast? so uh, just context for the listeners. So Steve is a, a personal coach. I've worked with Steve uh, myself quite extensively uh, around things. A lot of the work you do s- uh, stems around relationships, around uh, masculine, feminine, polarity, around cultivating the best version of yourself and you know different uh, aspects of success, different disciplines uh, needed. Uh, personally to attain success in different areas of your life, because it's not all one to one, like the, the energy that leads us to success in business isn't the same thing that's going to lead us to success in marriage. Uh, So you you do a great job uh, with with what you do. And uh, the cool thing, the part, you know, tying it all back to tech entrepreneurship, uh, you've built a community of hundreds of of guys all around the world. Uh, I don't know how many different countries, dozens, probably, uh, using, you know, the, kind of a common thread of what I just outlined, but all, you, you know, we're on Zoom, we're flying together, getting together in person and retreats, and you've built this like awesome community. Uh, you know, to me, that's uh, an amazing, uh, you know, tech entrepreneur feat right there. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to pause. I want to see if you have anything you want to add to the introduction, then we can dive in here. <laughs> Uh, first, thank you. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward this to this for a while now, and I'm wondering what I might have to offer. And then when you said that what works in business doesn't always work in relationships, and that made me think that something we could talk about today is that what works in really good relationships can also work really well in business. <laughs> and that's one twist I'd like to talk about today is that idea that we don't have to be two different people between how we make cash and how we make love. I just made that up. That sounds pretty good. But, uh, um, and so, yeah, yeah, that's what we do. And yeah, the relationships are usually the kind of pain that bring men into personal development work. And then they soon find out that what if I could be different everywhere in my life as a father, as a business owner, as a brother? Cool. It's a fun conversation. Yeah, yeah I love that. Um, let, let's dive into that. Let's start there. Let's dive into uh, unpacking that. Uh First thing that comes to mind for me, I had a, a story the other, the other day where uh, we had a a client that uh, just you know the person on on our team that was leading leading the account and the client just had a miscommunication and you know we all know how miscommunications can sometimes spiral out and then misunderstandings and it can lead to uh, just bad situations. So ultimately, we got on you know I, I got on the call with the customer and and just like first of all just owned the problem and then we had a regroup. We brought our team in, we brought their team in. We just kind of regrouped on everything and just kind of stitching together that communication went from you know turning a unhappy customer into a, a customer that appreciates a new level of of communication from us. And also, uh, I think it was even you know, even though it was kind of a hiccup, like a a bump in the road, I think it actually led to an opportunity to foster a a stronger long term relationship with them because they saw how we handled the situation. So uh, maybe maybe you have some better examples that you can (laughs) go in there. I don't know. I think that's the end of the show right there. That's kind of it. We could break down what happened there, right? With that that story is so good. And you know I'm going to steal it, right? Because it is so exemplary of what happens when um, honesty, ownership, right? This is what I heard. We were honest. We owned it. We are authentic. 
We were very uh, responsive and trustworthy. And what happened is that there was a whole new level of respect and connection and loyalty that happened in your relationship. And imagine if this was with your wife, right? When guys are pissing and moaning about their marriage and, and their sex life and all that, and you know right where I'm going. When you can be, own your shit, when you, I'm sorry for cussing, when you own your stuff and you are honest and you're authentic and you are unapologetic, but you are also responsive, Man, it just changes everything, and and I won't go into details, but you and I both know the stories of men who have turned marriages around with precisely how you handled that client issue. Yeah, totally. Uh, you can cuss on here, by the way, too. We're not uh, okay. a we're not a PG thirteen <laughs> show. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and so it reminds me back in the nineties, I was taking customer service uh, and customer delight classes about how to um, how to manage customer satisfaction. And one of the things was that it's better to make a mistake and and recover elegantly than to never have made a mistake at all. It builds more trust by how you responded. So even though you didn't intend to create the miscommunication, the way you responded set up a whole new level of trust and communication that wouldn't have happened if you didn't make the mistake. So mistakes aren't all bad. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I I think a lot of people uh, like worry about failure or worry about making mistakes. And uh, it's not you know, it's not the fact of making a mistake or having a failure, it's what you do with it. And, you know, the learning and then the opportunity to, uh, you know, to grow from it. Uh, I, you've got a really interesting career, I want to like change lanes, I'm putting on my left turn signal here, I want to change lanes. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you've, you've got an interesting background. I know you started out in corporate, I think you were actually in, in the tech space, uh, maybe a few decades ago. Building I computers, I yeah. But yeah. what was it? Building computers as building circuit boards and, and integrating boxes for Dell computer and, and also super computers. Yeah. And then you like bought a uh, bed and breakfast and ran like a hotel. And then now you're running, you know, probably I would guess the, the you know, the most uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but I, I've never experienced any community like what what you've created uh, internationally. You're, you're a good guys to great yeah. men community. So uh that's just like you know a, a wild career trajectory uh can you just do like a quick walk through that i'd love to kind of break that down a little bit chronologically you mean however however it makes sense like if there's a maybe there's a thread somewhere through there like just how you started how you kind of went from one to the next what you know what each chapter meant to you and uh you know that just it it's it's a really interesting trajectory for me yeah and y'all yeah. I'll talk quickly because I'm 61 years old. I won't take up your whole show. And I'll preface it with this thing that we're all trying to find out who we are, really. Even as young boys, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, we start finding out who we are and what we like. But we learn really quickly how to please other people and how to get our needs met. And sometimes it means we become really good at something that people want us to be good at. In my case, um, I was supposed to be good in school. So I became really good in school. I came from an athletic family. So being good at sports was rewarded and appreciated. So I became really good at sports. Soccer was my sport. And then I got good at college. And then I had an uncle who was an engineer who said, you need to be an engineer. So I took engineering <laughs> in college. I had a sneaking suspicion by the time I got to college that I wasn't being the me I wanted to be. I still like sports and all that. But I, the, the whole tech side, I was pursuing just because I was told I was good at it and I should be doing that. And so I joined Texas Instruments in the early 80s and started making bombs and all the stuff that we do in defense electronics. Then I started making supercomputers. And then I, I became in contract manufacturing. And as professionally, I found out that I like people. And so the, the heart side of this was that I liked being liked, which is a nice guy habit that we won't go into unless you want to. But but guys who are overly concerned with being a performer and achieving to get recognition and money and getting the adoration and acceptance of other people, they get really good at being a chameleon. You'll do whatever you have to do. I became a great quality assurance manager. I became an expert in IS. 
ISO 9000 certifications, right? I became a process engineering manager with Hewlett Packard, which is a really people centered business. And, and then uh, later I had this opportunity to get out of high tech and run a bed and breakfast for people with horses. And that's when my horse career started back in 2000 and staying late up at night, playing guitar and making coffee at 5 a.m. It's all people. I'm starting to see that, hey, I'm good with people and I like people. And I, I, the other thing I did for cash, which was tech, was something I just put up with. I endured that. And then later I got out of that and took a job as a property manager. It was going to be for like five years. It wound up for 11 years from like, um, I don't know, 19, it went for, it ended in 2005, whenever subtract 1995 to then I was a property manager and I learned about water systems and heavy equipment and keeping track of a thousand properties. And it was an HOA and everyone knows what that means. And so I was moving from tech into people and then I got divorced. And so, as you know, that, that, that earthquake, that, that tsunami of emotion, when, when you get divorced, which you and I can both relate to it, it, it shakes up things inside you that you've been hiding. And that is a certain level of, vulnerability that's evidenced by the pain you're feeling and the sadness and, and the wondering of what the hell happened and why did this happen and what does this mean and who who the hell am I? So as I'm letting go of the technical expertise, I'm starting to see I have an expertise in communicating about feelings and relationships and making it safe for men to talk about feelings and stuff that we're not used to talking about. And it became my core competency, right? That's a 1990s term, I realized. But my, my, my gift or my zone of genius was in connecting with people around the truth, reality. And I hated the performance art that I perfected as a technologist, just pretending to be good at something to make people like me and to pay me money. And now entering the world of being real. I mean, really authentic and really honest and really open hearted and very responsive and very available and becoming a better listener than a talker. And as I heard you tell that story about the client issue with the miscommunication, I heard those traits in you coming out when you got the teams together. And it's really simple, right? And it, what, the other thing I found out I'm good at is making complex crap simple. What happened in that conference room is the basic story that everybody has available to them, that when they find out who they really are and what they really believe in, you can finally stop performing to protect your ego and to protect the insecure feeling of not being liked. Then you can finally give everything you've got to give. And I think that's why you're so successful in business, is because you figured this out earlier than most. Well, there's uh, there's two directions that I would love to uh, to go from here. So uh, one of them is kind of just like, you know, exploring this, you know, you had this like fire to build this thing, this uh, this community that you built. And uh, I've heard kind of the, some of the stories of how it started out and some of those moments where you're like, all right, well, we're going to rent this hacienda in Mexico. We're going <laughs> to buy tickets. And like you and Tim, who put it on, you're like, we're going to fly down there. And if it's just me and you there, we're still going to have a damn good time. but you know, a whole bunch of guys show up and it's this, you know, amazing experience. And, you know, obviously it's profitable for you guys because you keep doing it. And it's a, a, a phenomenal business that you've created, not just, you know, it's a business and, and I'm sure you make great money doing it, but it's also like a phenomenal service that you're giving to the community. And uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so there's that piece of it, like, like how, you know, far, part of it is like the, the, the kind of like the distilled version of that to me, you know, where I'm going with that is, uh, you know, how, uh, what was that like, you know, getting into building, building this community, like digital marketing, SEO, making YouTube content, you know, clearly this was all new to you. So what was that like? And then the other avenue we can take it uh, after that is, uh, you know, just kind of like describing, I guess, a lot of the you know, there, I'm sure some of the listeners here will have some exposure to what, you know, what you teach and, and work on in the community, but probably very little is my guess. So maybe, you know, just kind of break down some of the core basics of what you teach and, and work on in the community. Uh, let's start with the, let's start with kind of like the building of the business piece first, like how, how that was in the, like the first six months, year, two years, whatever, getting this business off the ground. Okay. <clears throat> I think, I think it started with enthusiasm. One reason we get along is because you're enthusiastic too about what you do. Um, 
I had never been enthusiastic about any work I'd done before work. You know, the alarm clock goes off and you go to work. I'd never been enthusiastic. I'd been very dedicated and gritty and consistent, but never enthusiastic, which seems to be kind of like that's that's unnecessary or that's not normal. You're not supposed to be enthusiastic. It's the first time in my life I felt enthusiastic and scared at the same time. Enthusiastic was that I was starting to learn things I wish I would have learned when I was 20 or that my dad or grandfather or somebody could have taught me. And I was 51 years old and I'm learning stuff at an exponential rate that's blowing my mind. And I'm realizing that there's nobody out there talking about this in a way I think men need to hear. And I thought for the first time, maybe my gift isn't in learning stuff quickly about technology or being a good soccer player, maybe what I'm supposed to be doing, supposed to be doing, is sharing this gift that I have for enthusiasm and making something that's rare, common in the world of men. And it's that one thing right there that made the community grow the way it has is because the best marketing tool in the world is enthusiasm and love for your product. Of course, the next thing after that is extremely clearly and poignantly describing what that is and what the benefits of it are. That's what people pay for, right? But but it started with enthusiasm, unbridled enthusiasm, not knowing what how much money could be made, but letting money become an indicator of success as opposed to a requirement for success. And so I started reading and taking classes and getting coaches and learning about crap I didn't know, like SEO and, and copywriting and co- copywriting became my passion. And then people were coming out of the woodwork to, woodwork to say, dude, I like what you're doing. I like your energy. So like Tim Wade at a meetup here in Fort Collins, I started out of the blue, a meetup with just one person it was me in the chair. Uh, now we, we have 15 guys show up regularly. Tim showed up to one and said, I'm getting divorced, dude. I want to work with you. I want to do what you do. And um, he had some prior coaching experience. So we started retreats saying, let's do this. Um, it was risky. The, the scary part is that people may not like you. They may not show up. You may spend money on something that doesn't have any return to it. But the one thing we counted on was our enthusiasm for it and a belief that if we're enthusiastic about this, if we are this enthusiastic, there's got to be somebody else who is too. This can't just be a, a one-off thing. So we just had a belief system. And again, it's not much of a business plan. But a belief system, if we keep it simple and we make it fun and we make it easy for people to to join us, that should be a good enough business plan for now. Simple, fun, and easy, which is still my business plan. But I always bring the the enthusiasm for the content, which is, I know, the second thing you want to talk about, some of the main messages. But, But it was the consistent, and this is another thing I didn't have in my life. I showed up because the alarm clock went off in the early part of my life. Alarm clock goes off and everyone knows what happens after that. And then you get in the car and you go to work and then you come home. I can do that consistently. It was like a robot. What I didn't know I can do consistently was actually create content every day to send an email every week, to write an article for a big website every Saturday, to consistently show up. And what I learned and in, in read was that There's this consistent, gritty drip, drip, drip of enthusiasm and content that you just keep pouring into the universe, knowing that if you do it clearly enough, there's a segment of the universe that goes, holy shit, me too. And and I had to put faith in the fact the sliver of the universe that I talk to is extremely small. It's almost invisible. But when you get into it, it widens up into an incredible uh, pasture, if you will. Of, of topics. And, and we go everything from, from sex to, to women, to marriage, to fatherhood, to brotherhood. And we have a new course coming out on the uh, open-hearted leadership and how to be a leader with this energy, which is kind of a segue to the second thing you wanted to talk about. But Yeah. While you were just talking, uh, the part when you were talking about uh, just consistency showing up and believing that there's this little sliver of a universe of people out there that just are like a hell yes to what you have to say. And then once you get in there, it just widens up. I mm-hmm. I felt like a chill go down my spine when, when you were talking about that, because it just, it resonates so true. I mean, it's so amazing how when you can, uh, and like, you know, video content, uh, audio, this is a medium to be able to bottle enthusiasm. Like in con- in text, you can't bottle enthusiasm as easily, but like video, <laughs> you can bottle your enthusiasm and like serve it as a, as a product. So uh, that's what I love about video, but uh, yeah. you just uh, like gave me a, a chill down my spine listening to you talk about that because it is so true and it's so powerful. 
and and you brought up now i think twice in this call you brought up uh divorce and people that are listening that are here listening because they're like tech people thinking about how to build businesses probably have no clue why uh we're talking about divorce here so uh you know g- <laughs> give us a little bit about your your business your community uh why you know marketing marketing side how you bring men into the the community and then when they get there like what do they find that's maybe different from what they thought from the marketing. Okay. I want to make sure I answer the question you asked. Um, and you can go on a to... tangent. I, I go on tangents all the time. <laughs> okay. so feel free to go on a tangent. We yeah. Can talk about. You can repeat the question. <laughs> I'll start with the, uh, as part of marketing was, well, you got to come up with the name for what you do. And and some say, people say, well, your name should give some indication what you do. You know, you see these names like Intuit and names that for companies, you have no idea what they do. I believe I like simple and I like really clear. I love things that are simple and clear, especially complex things. And so when I came up with good guys, two great men, it says that we're starting with guys who already know that they're not they're not shit. Right. They're not they're not bad people. <laughs> they're a good guy. But they, they're thinking that's part of the problem. Maybe I've been too much of a good guy and I, I would rather feel more great. And so we we define the transition from good guy to great men in many different categories about money and sexuality and your relationship, your emotional world, your health and fitness, spirituality. We, we talk a lot of categories. This is where the pasture gets big when we talk to men. And, and so as I was creating the business, I wanted to create – Uh, an entry place where men would come in. And I said, well, I just have to pick the one that happened to me. And that was divorce. It was the maximum amount of pain that I've ever felt in my life. Emotional pain, spiritual pain, intellectual pain. Why, 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 right? Right. There's physical pain related to divorce. It was was crushing. (laughs) And so it made me go online and Google and start reading stuff in obscure parts of the internet that most people don't know exist where men's work happens. All right. This is different than red pill work, which is a you know totally different thing. This is men's personal development work around relationship and masculinity. And I found myself going in there reading stuff that blew my mind, but I didn't think it was enough. It, it wasn't being presented enthusiastically enough. <laughs> it needed to have a bigger voice. And so when I went and did that and discovered the power of video, then things started really changing for me. Good guys to great men came in through the divorce wound I call death by female. It's a little bitty incision right here, right here in the heart. And when men go into that wound, right, instead of saying, oh, since we can cuss, fuck her, fuck this, right? Fuck her, which a lot of guys do, and they kick her to the curb and they go on and they repeat the same thing for the next two decades. They just keep doing the same stuff that they've done. Very, very uh, the, in this end. Yeah. And they, and they, yeah, they don't learn anything. And so the guys in my community say, I think I'm supposed to learn something from this. That's what happened to me. Again, everything is a reflection of my experience, which I learned is a very common experience. My life has been a cliche up to the divorce part. Right? Like, yeah, sure. Yeah, I got divorced. And she said all these things. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. You're so controlling. I never felt like I could be me. We never had a connection. I want to feel free and alive, blah, blah, all the stuff that we hear. And, uh, and I thought it was a very personal attack on my masculine value, my sexual value. Everything I'd ever done to try to keep it together was suddenly worthless. That death by female, which is joking because the, what you learn later is that it wasn't her fault. She was telling you her truth. And so the realization is there's something to learn about how we show up. I might have gotten divorced if I knew everything I knew because there's another part of a relationship, which is her, right? But I also realized that there are things like – Being self-reliant, knowing that you can feel confident, you can feel a sense of swagger and mojo and a sense of value in yourself without getting sex from a woman. You can feel generous and powerful and and self-driven and self-propelled in your emotional world without feeling like somebody else needs to give it to you. And what I found out about the most in most healthy marriages and relationships are men who achieve first a certain level of self-reliance and self-love and self-appreciation to where they weren't always secretly trying to get needs met the way we did when we were teenagers. And when we figure this out, life gets easier. You become more authentic. You speak slower. You're more honest. You're less apologetic. 
you see things for what they are. And again, this is making me think of that conference or meeting you had where you walk in and you go, hey, let's talk about what happened, <laughs> right? With no fear, no defensiveness, no competition for being right or being wrong. And, and so the, the curriculum I developed, which goes deep into that wound of feeling like we're not strong enough men or we don't even know what it means to be a man. Once we go there and figure that out and men go back into their marriages, back into their church or into their business or into a new relationship, as you know, a lot of our guys start dating again or get remarried, the whole thing changes. Now, it doesn't change other people right away, but that's the thing. You figure out that you don't have to change other people. You just change yourself, and then everything around you starts changing on its own. Yeah, it's it's total mindset shift. And I, I personally experienced a mindset shift working with you. We've, we've been working together for, man, it's been like, what, five, six years now? It's crazy. Time flies. Like it, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, total mindset shift, and uh, it's it ripples. It's your whole life. It's not just like relationships or marriages it's a rippling effect and uh you know and, and you nailed it like having that authenticity with your employees with your customers with your partners anybody in in the business world that you work with uh that that like energy that uh way of being you know you talk about doing versus being like that way of being in life has just like a powerful impact on the people that you're uh, that you're working with. And uh, do you have any I, I know you're about to launch a new uh, product offering or course or something around uh, like entrepreneurship or, or business. So I, I don't know exactly. Uh, I, I don't know all the details yet. But uh, can you give can you give a teaser? Like, how does this stuff apply to business? Like, how do you take this this energy into business and, uh, and win in business while also lifting up people around you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, we have a sales page. I won't share the screen. I can give you that link later because it it, 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 it answers yeah, all the email questions. Email me the link. We'll, we'll put that in the show yeah. notes. Yeah, that's great. Um, so there's this problem in that people who are good leaders, um, traditionally good managers, good business people, right? Um, they, they have a belief that there's one way to do that. And then there's one way to go home and be a husband. And so we we have this persona we adopt sometimes where we, we're trying to follow you know, Peter Drucker's model for business management or whoever your business guy is, right? Senge or Stephen Covey. Um, we, we try to adopt this thing and, and we're pretending and we get mad when we don't get the results. The open hearted leader course is about integrating the man who survives his divorce and finds out there's a really important side of him that is honest, it's open, it's truthful, it's unapologetic, he's calm, he's confident, and he listens, and he's he just feels in a natural state of well-being all the time. If that guy goes into his business and starts a business or changes the way he leads that way, there is a sudden shift in the environment around him. If he has been feeling an environment of, of disrespect or lack of cooperation, or not feeling appreciated, or being misunderstood as a leader, right? he finds out that when he becomes a very trustworthy, honest, clear-speaking, appreciative, respectful person to others, everything starts morphing. Everyone starts copying him instead of playing his game of sometimes intimidation, competition, conflict management, you know, threats, subtle threats, and all these things that we do in business to try to get people to perform better. And then he starts to hire better, right? He'll start weeding people out who don't like that model of being because they're stuck in a conflict-driven competitive model. And he starts hiring better people who thrive in that environment. That's when businesses, I think, really take off. When you first start, it's good to, when we're dating, right? If we take it over to the dating world, guys are worried about dating. We say, no, when you start dating, your job is to turn away nine out of 10 of the prospects by being so clear about what you believe in and what you're enthusiastic about and what you want and where you're going. You're so clear, nine out of 10 of them go, holy crap, I'm not sure I could keep up. <laughs> That's the best thing. But that one, that one out of 10 goes, holy crap, I didn't know they made men like you anymore. Oh my God, it's scary, but I want to, I want to date you. You scare that, me. That hiring you know. piece uh, you touched on. I, I love that. And it's, it's funny, like the drawing the parallels between like dating and, and hiring. It's uh, probably 
you don't want to say that to your HR person, I don't think, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're filtering, you're filtering out candidates according to your value system. Yeah. Right? And it's, uh, it's interesting because like, you know, it, hiring. So we, we do a ton of hiring. We're always interviewing. We have a recruiting team or, you know, getting thousands of applicants sometimes per week. And, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you've got to, you know, look at their, their experience, like, where do they come from? And, you know, what have they done? Then you look at their skills and you test their skills. Like if they're, if they're interviewing for an engineering position, it's like, how do you, uh, you know, just test testing their skills, like put them through a technical coding test. And then we can see, all right, how fast do they write code? Are they doing the right things? Are they, you know, doing best practices like test driven development or reusability in their code, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then there's like the behavioral interviewing side, which is really important. And it's hard to get right 100% of the time, like the the technical skills part, we can get that right 100% of the time. But like the behavioral side is really hard to get right, because it's like a gut feeling in a way. It's, you know, you can ask behavioral questions. And, you know, I, my uh, my business coach, Mike Krupit, uh, he... Um, he talks a lot about how uh, the past, is, the you know, it, it, you know, in in, uh, in interviewing people, past uh, performance is an indication of future performance. So <laughs> if you can like ask behavioral questions to understand how people uh, handle the situation and behave in a particular situation in the past, that's an indication of how they'll behave in the future. You you don't want to get too wrapped up in like future hypotheticals in the interviewing process. Uh, it's more about like focusing on the past. Yeah. Tell me about uh, a time when you had a client really piss you off. How did you handle that? Tell me about a time when X, Y, Z. Yeah. Those are great questions. Yeah. And then like digging in, like, and then the, the trick that I, I like to do is like dig into that. So if you, if you touch on something that there feels like there's something there and they kind of give you like a half answer, then it's like really dig in and like try to get the real hundred percent full scoop and like how they felt about it and how they handled it and why they handled it that way and where that came from. And, uh, so it's like, but it's still, it's, it's never perfect. I mean, we've made plenty of bad hires over the years. So, uh, you know, how, uh, I know you've hired people, you've selected coaches for your, your, uh, community. Uh, what are some of the things you look for when you're hiring and how do you, uh, you know, in the past when you've hired and then currently when, you know, you're selecting coaches for, for your community and you're looking for, qualifications of what makes a leader a leader or what makes somebody who's like process oriented and tactical like how do you select things that need you know when you're trying to select for the soft skills yeah um it's all soft skills and coaching pretty much i i i subcontract out all the uh tactical skills you know logistical technical skills i subcontract that out because for those i need somebody who's a website Walker. I hired a coach one time to, for me who's a marketing guy. And um, that's all he thinks about is human psychology and the process of persuasion and what makes people pick one thing over another. Uh, he's a he's a geek about it. So I, I, I pick people based on what they're enthusiastic about that I want to learn. Now, the people we bring in the community to be leaders and coaches, it's pretty simple. They they need to be, they need to share my value system. That's easy to say, though, because the next question is, okay, great. Hey, what's your value system? <laughs> Which is a question most people can't answer. Oh, I want you to share my value system. Okay, great. What's that? Well, I'm not really sure how to put it into words. <laughs> well, we teach guys how to put a value system into words. Who is it you want to be? How do you want to be? What do you believe is important? What are priorities for you in relationships? Uh, spiritually speaking, this is a weird word. In our business agreement, we have a section called the spiritual agreement. It's probably the only contract uh, that has a spiritual section in it because it has a belief system in it. I want people to believe in some of the things I believe in, in the sense of abundance. Like as soon as you start feeling scarcity and competition and anger and, and threat, you have to realize that there's another system that probably works better, and that's a belief in abundance. And that if you spiritually align with abundance, you start doing things that create abundance, just like a mindset of scarcity will make you create a system of scarcity, which also which comes with it is hiring people who are insecure, people are fearful, people who see everyone as a threat and competition. And then you have a company where nobody's talking, right? And so what I like to attract is the people who believe what I believe, which means I had to write down what it is I believe in. 
Yeah. yeah. And I've, I've seen that. I've seen both of those types of cultures. And uh, what's even like more of a mind fuck sometimes is you see some of those cultures that like a lot of us say we don't want that like negative scarcity culture where it's cutthroat and all this stuff. And you see some of those companies and they're like, they're, they're like big companies. They grow, they're big, they're dominating industries. And it's like sometimes a mind fuck to see that. And then, uh, but, you know, at the same time, it's like coming back to your personal values, like how do you, and your company values, like how do you want, how do you, like what type of environment do you want to work in? Who are the people you want working in there? What do you want it to feel like when you're at work and interacting with others? And I think that's ultimately for me, what it comes down to, like what, what experience do I want inside, you know, the, inside of my company. But uh, it is, uh, it, it is interesting to see how, like how different, culture can be from company to company yeah i've only worked for one company that came close to what i've created but i use my experience with it was convex computer that one of the first air-cooled supercomputers that competed with cray and um and bob palak who's the ceo he came from another company um i forget it was some disk drive company where he was a big manager this guy this guy he stood about five foot eight wasn't really in shape, but he was the most passionate, enthusiastic guy. And he talked about values. He talked about things that I've never heard guys on a stage talking to a company talk about, about cooperation and why we do what we do and how we're helping the world. But also how we work with each other is just as important as how we help our clients. He considered the employees to be his number one resource. He had no such thing as sick days. He goes, how can you have trust in a company where you're counting sick days? Our, our, our policy is that if you're sick, don't come to work. And when you come back, do your best to catch up. That was his policy. It, when we got to a thousand people, they said, well, you have to have an employee manual. And, and he said, oh, okay, here's my employee manual. The very first sentence says, we'll never do anything stupid because it's written down. That was the first <laughs> sentence of the employee manual. Dress code. You can wear anything you want to work as long as you believe it's appropriate. That was the dress code policy. And the next day, four programmers turned up in their pajamas because they thought it was appropriate because they spend so much time there. Nobody cared. These guys are working in their pajamas. Right. I mean, that's the and, thing. It's like, you know, how do you, um, and, and, and like all these employee manuals and like, you know, documents they they always set out with the best of intentions. And like, as my company grows, like we used to have like more loose, you know, everything. And now it's like, all right, well now we need like, you know, uh, WISP security policies and we need, you know, like all these like compliance things put in place and we need these documentations in place. And, you know, we start hiring lawyers and it's like, you know, now we're like dealing with lawyers and they're doing all this, you know, stuff that I try to read what they write and I don't even understand it. And, uh, you know, so it's, uh, I feel like a lot of companies set out with the best of intentions, but it's like really hard to maintain, you know, you almost have to like go against the advice of counsel and, uh, and, and like a lot of mainstream thinking to really intentionally keep your company that way. Yeah. I, I, I don't ever think we should underestimate the power of one enthusiastic leader, right? It can go bad, right? <laughs> or it can go good, right? Depending on your nature. If you're a leader of a company who finally has a thousand page employee manual and you hold it up in front of them and go, we had to do this. And what Bob said was that, but we're never going to do something stupid just because it's written down. Yeah. So he was already dissing the manual saying, what matters most is you doing what you believe is right and what is best and most effective and efficient. You have to do that, right? We know that there's an outside set of laws and things that make us write things like pop manuals. But the feeling I want for everybody that I talk to in this company is that you feel that you're a part of something bigger and the decisions you make are yours. You have autonomy, Right. Everyone had a five hundred dollar you know line of credit. They can buy anything they want at any time if it didn't go over five hundred without approval. Is this trust? He believed that a company where there was not a constant level of trust and appreciation for each other is going to fail. And he didn't want to fail because there wasn't trust. And that's so that's how he did it. And when I said you can't underestimate your power as a leader, one person who who drips that constantly, that message with every email, every speech, every company meeting, Every conference room problem solving session with a client, right? Like you did. And I keep coming back to that because I love the story. Um, they'll be successful. You never know long and you never know if your product is going to be viable forever. Products come and go. But that style of leadership allows you to go home to a wife and she says, How was your day? And you go, It's amazing. Thanks. 
let's cook something. All right. That's it. It was amazing. And that because you knew you were you, you were you in the lane that you want to drive in. The way you were being is who you wanted to be, even on a bad day. Yeah, I love a that. Uh, so um, what what happened to the company? Did it, did it sell or still around or? Hewlett Packard bought them. Hewlett Packard. Okay. Yeah. So we did workstations it, uh, were starting to take over. Did they uh, preserve any of the magic or did it just get absorbed by the Borg? It got absorbed by the Borg very a couple of years after it happened. Although HP has the HP way, right? So they have their own culture and they did a pretty good job for many years of maintaining that. Even there, they are struggling now to maintain their HP way culture. But so it was a good company buyout. If any company was to buy Convex, HP was a good company to do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, cool. I had left the year before to do my six month motorhome odyssey when I was 35 years old. So that was the part where I disappeared off the grid for six months to go live this dream of living in a motorhome with three dogs and a cat. And then uh, that's when I, in between Texas and Colorado, I didn't talk about my geographical journey, but that's like the new, uh, the new thing nowadays. You're ahead of the times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know when I was 35, you know, back then the, the quote everyone was uh, spouting off was nobody ever lied on their deathbed wishing they had worked longer, right? That's what people were talking about when I was, this is 1980, no, it was 1994, 95. And so, yeah, I wanted to do that. Everyone thought that uh, either me or my wife were dying. The only reason you would quit a job and buy a motorhome and sell everything you've got is if you're terminally ill. Only dying people do stuff like that. And then later songs are coming out. You ought to live like you're dying. Um, so I became a fan of that. I'm no hippie, right? I have a real, uh, real practical sense of what people should do and how we should do it. But then I, I had a real streak of of totally undoing my programming because I was I was hard programmed for a certain way of being until I finally hit the wall. We got a guy on our team. Uh, he's been with us four years or so. Uh, lives in the philly area just decided to move to columbia oh nice south america yeah just like i, I don't know how he picked columbia but he's like yeah i'm moving to columbia i was like oh wow <laughs> <laughs> that's so weird i was at my men's meet up locally on wednesday two nights ago and one guy is moving down there too oh really wow we met a Colombian woman named monica and he goes you guys i just can't tell you how great she is <laughs> so he's a real <laughs> fan of columbia well, may, maybe our guy's onto something here. Or something. Maybe we might be onto something. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Um, all right. So as we uh, kind of wrap up here, is there anything else that I didn't cover that you uh, were, were hoping we'd cover, or anything else you want to you know put out there? Hmm. If I was to respond, I would probably make something up for the sake of sounding smart, right? So. I don't want to make something up. I think we covered a lot. Yeah, I, the main thing I wanted to talk about was this, the chameleon effect between work and play and, and love and marriage and sex. Uh, if I can say anything to the people listening, men or women, that don't buy into the idea that you have to have different hats for different roles. There is one place you can go that is the most you you have ever been, and it will be the most effective you'll ever be at any role you're in. And it feels a lot easier to move from environment to environment or role to role, staying you without thinking you need to go in and perform. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, it's a powerful statement. And it doesn't uh, it doesn't make sense. Like when you first hear that, you know, if it's something that, in, in, you know, if I can, you know, speaking for myself, when I, you know, before I could understand that hearing that, you know, it sounds like I could possibly in theory see see what you're saying but it doesn't really make sense until it makes sense and uh it's such a distilled simple phrase to say but there's so much work like so much you know time and work and like just being honest with yourself that it takes to get to that point that yeah. uh like that's just such a like a simple and elegant way to put it the way you just said it yeah and, and even in an easier way and you've heard us do this at retreats who do you know who lives like that? And guys will go, hmm, oh, my grandfather or something like that. I don't know how he does it, man. His life seems so easy, man. He just seems so dialed in. He seems so unrattled. He just seems, he knows who he is and he knows what he believes in and nothing bothers him. He, he takes nothing personally. And when he speaks, he speaks in very short sentences, but it's like the best words. 
I don't know how he does it. And everyone wants to be like the old, old guy, the old grandfather. And the, the simple secret is that what he's learned is that he just needs to stop playing. He needs to stop competing for attention and know who he is, which it, again is the hardest thing is to know who you really are, what you really believe in, what you really want most, what turns you on and where you want to take all this before you die. Those are the questions we answer in this work. And once you get those under your belt, you become that guy we were talking about. Yeah. It just glides. Yeah. I'm laughing in my head because like we're, we're, we're on video, like making a podcast to release out into the world and like, you know, to get eyeballs and earballs listening. And it's like, you know, it's like, it's like the, the, uh, what's the word, uh, like the catch 22 of like, just not like not trying to get attention, but like we're producing content to get attention. <laughs> like, it's like, I, I don't know. I just laughed about that for a second. I love that you're you aware of that you can watch us doing this and you know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> That's the observer mindset. Yeah. I love it. That's powerful. But, uh, Steve, thanks, man. This is awesome. I, I really appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, thanks for your time here. I loved it. Let's do it again sometime. All right. Catch you later. All right. Bye-bye.